There are a couple of questions that have been raised by folks individually um, on the basis of our teaching yesterday that I just wanted to return to. Uh, so before we move ahead into our next section in James, uh, let me just go back uh, and touch on a couple of these matters first. Um, one is a kind of detailed matter uh, having to do with the Greek text. And again, I confess I'm sort of shifting my approach on the fly um, because uh, I was under the impression, and it was, I'm sure, my fault, uh, that this would be mainly a group of students who were working in the English Bible and didn't have Greek. Um, and obviously we've, we've discovered that, in fact, most of you have some uh, amount of Greek. And so that, that's led me, again, not to turn this into a Greek-based class, there are a lot of you who don't have Greek, and, and you know, I, I don't want to do that to you. Uh, but nevertheless, to say a little bit more uh, about the Greek text than I planned on saying. And so one of the things I'd like to just return to uh, is an issue that is a translational issue uh, that was raised at lunchtime. Uh, and uh, it has to do with James' use of the word aneir, um, which has been very controversial in terms of translation. Uh, and, and the reason it, it's been controversial is because it has often been argued that the Greek word aneir, in contrast to the Greek word anthropos, um, is a distinctly uh, uh, male term. It, it refers usually in the New Testament uh, to husbands as opposed to wives, for instance, and often appeals, uh, uh, applies to males as opposed to females. And like, unlike, again, anthropos, which everyone agrees, uh, is a word that um, uh, does refer to uh, men and women uh, equally. So let's just look uh, from this standpoint at the first chapter of James, where we have a couple of interesting occurrences. Um, let's start with verse 7. Uh, here, uh, uh, in the Greek text, we have the word anthropos. Now, um, here, all of the, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say all. <clears throat> um, most of the versions uh, over the last uh, 15 or 20 years recognize that anthropos is indeed generic, as it usually is in Scripture. And so, T and IV translates here person. Uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, ESV translates here person, uh, which is a change from the RSV. Of course, the ESV is based on the RSV, but again, the ESV uh, translators themselves, uh, you know, prominent among them, Wayne, Wayne Grudem, for instance, recognized that the English language had changed at this point, that man uh, wasn't generic anymore, uh, and so they, they changed to person. And they've done that uh, a couple of thousand times uh, in the Bible, just recognizing where the language has changed. Uh, so, so most of the modern versions recognize, again, that indeed uh, a person is the right way to translate here. Um, the TNIV goes with the plural. Those who doubt should not think they will receive anything from the Lord. And uh, uh, the reason that, 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 that this uh, happens is because of the follow-up in verse 8. In other words, if you're going to follow a translation philosophy that says he, him, and his now signal to most English readers and speakers a reference to men in distinction from women. And if you decide that in verse 7, James has used a word that is generic, referring to men and women equally, then you have to ask the question from a translation standpoint, uh, can we follow up the word person in verse 8 with the word he? You see, uh, that's how the sequence goes here. So if you're going to avoid this third person masculine pronoun, uh, one way to do that is to move to the uh, plural. Uh, so uh, again, just looking at the spectrum here, T and IV does this by pluralizing those who doubt they are double-minded, verse 8. Uh, the net Bible uses person in verse 7 and he in verse 8, as does the ESV. Uh, the NLT uh, does a uh, person and such people. Now, that's anthropos. Now, what's interesting is that our author shifts in verse 12, however, to, um, I, I'm sorry, in, in, I, I'm sorry, in, in verse 8, uh, he shifts to aner. So, in other words, 
uh, in verse uh, 7, let not uh, that person think that that person will receive anything from the Lord. And then aner is the follow-up in verse 8. Now, the, the point here, and I'm making it more complicated than it needs to be. I apologize. It's uh, still a little bit early. Uh, the point here is this. A lot of people will say aner always has to be translated in a masculine way. That, that anthropos is generic. Okay, and you can translate that person or something. But aner is he. It, it's, it, it's a man. Um, and, and the point I would just make here is this, that I think it's been shown pretty conclusively, and especially in James, that this is not the case, that that's just not true, and you can do the study yourself. For instance, we're talking about the uh, proverbial nature of James. If you look at the book of Proverbs, I, th I, I shouldn't quote stats off the top of my head, but as I recall, there are 30 occasions in the book of Proverbs where in the Hebrew you have ish, Septuagint translates aner, um, and all the modern versions, including the ESV, translate person in a generic sense. In other words, I think there's quite clear evidence that especially in this proverbial type of material, uh, based partly on the Septuagint, that aner was being used in a generic way like anthropos. And if you're just looking at James 1, 7 to 8, it's sure difficult to think that James is shifting from generic person in verse 7 to masculine in verse 8 uh, because it's a follow-up. The, the, the two go together here, you see. So that's why I think it is quite justified in my view for us to translate the word aner, especially here in James, uh, with uh, a generic uh, reference here. And I would just note that in verse 12, for instance, uh, of the five versions I have with me here, uh, TNIV, NLT, and uh, NET all do translate on air in a generic way. And I think that's just a recognition of the way that word is used, particularly in James. Uh, uh, and so I think that's, that's justified to do that there. Now, um, the um, other point that perhaps uh, I should have made uh, more clearly yesterday um, and did not, uh, has to do with uh, this, uh, and I think we touched on it, but let me just talk about it again. The use of the language in verses 10 and 11 uh, about the rich person. Remember we talked about who this rich person is. Um, and uh, uh, the point I would just like to make a little bit more clearly, and I think I touched on it again, is the, the way James here again is incorporating scripture. Um, uh, Isaiah 40, verses 6 and 7 is, is very obvious. Most of us know that text well because of the way it's uh, used in the New Testament elsewhere. Um, and by the way, here's one of these connections with 1 Peter that's also very interesting, which I should have mentioned yesterday as well. Uh, James and 1 Peter have a, a lot in common. And, and there, there's clearly, I mean, it, it, clearly, it's very unlikely they're borrowing from each other. But again, what we have here is almost certainly both Peter and James picking up some general early Christian teaching uh, that they share at this point. So again, uh, allusion to Isaiah 46 and 7, uh, also a probable allusion here to Job 14.2. Uh, and the point again is that, is that in the Old Testament, these verses are not judgment verses. These are verses about the transitory nature of human existence. And I, I just bring that up in, in order to, again, give a little bit more basis for, for my argument or my conclusion that, Paul, that the James might indeed here be talking about a rich, well-to-do, uh, higher class Christian. Uh, because the, the texts he sort of uses here and alludes to don't talk about judgment. The rich man is going to be judged, which would mean he's a non-Christian, uh, but the rich person uh, is, is, is going to uh, uh, not be a permanent fixture in terms of his wealth. All that wealth and all of that, that, that accumulation of goods and, and then that status in the world, all of that's going to disappear. It's, it's a vapor, it's a smoke, to use the language James uses in chapter 4. Uh, any other questions on, on 1, 2 to 18 before we move on? So, yes, sir. Just going back to that Anair Anthropos, uh -huh. is there any significance in the switch um, 
between the words? Or? I I doubt it. I think James uses these words virtually interchangeably. Now, I wouldn't say that for, the, for all of the New Testament, certainly. I mean, in most of the New Testament, it's clear, on there is male, husband, male versus female. I don't doubt, doubt, doubt that at all. But it's just that, as, you know, as we know, some of these distinctions in words that originally existed, partly under the influence of Hebrew, uh, partly for other reasons, tend to disappear over time. There tends to be a blurring and an overlapping. And that happens with so many words which were originally distinct, let's say back in classical Greek, but by the time you get to New Testament Greek, uh, things are murkier and words are beginning to overlap in meaning and you can't make firm distinctions any longer between this preposition and that one. Uh, they, have, they have semantic fields that overlap is the, kind of the diagram that we think about here. And that seems to be the case again as James is using, and the reason for that is because of his um, uh, being rooted in this proverbial wisdom uh, literature where this is especially happening very often. Yes, sir? With regards to uh, the, the influence that uh, some of the <coughs> other literature forms that you've mentioned, the intertestamental, intertestamental works, wisdom, and the Sirach, what influence do you think they play in the, the general understanding of the Jewish world that James was writing to, the diaspora? And do you see those works as being directly um, quoted in James, or do you see him just having an understanding of those? And did his audience have an understanding of those? Yeah, again, the question about audience is a difficult one. Uh, on, on my view, again, I still... You know, uh, just a, a parenthesis here, probably all of us hold views with varying degrees of certainty. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of views I hold that are close to 100%. I can't imagine any amount of evidence ever changing my view on them. There are other views I hold with 50.1% where uh, I could change my mind overnight without too much difficulty. I'm not quite sure where my understanding of the destination of James falls on the spectrum. Uh, I, I still tend to think James is writing to a specific group of churches, perhaps. Uh, Balkum again, thinks it's just general to all of them. But on either view, I don't know who those group of churches were. I don't know what they were like. I don't know what those persons' backgrounds were. I don't know how much education they had. Uh, and, and certainly, if, if, if Bauckham is right, then we have an incredibly diverse audience. So the question about audience is so hard to answer. I think the most we can say is that we certainly have evidence from a number of Jewish writings from the period that this proverbial wisdom stuff was in the air. Uh, people would have known it to some extent uh, as Jewish people because of the traditions that, that, that were part of their life, just as, you know, Faithful Christians who go to church in our day are going to know phrases and language, let's say, from some of the great hymns of the church. Uh, and they might not know who wrote the hymn or what date it was written, but by, they sure know the language uh, because it's part of their tradition, you see. And I think that's probably the case with this wisdom material as well. Um, no, James never quotes from that material. And of course, here, here's where the New Testament does seem to draw some pretty clear lines in saying, the, 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 the obvious exceptions we all know about, the problem passage are Jude 9 and Jude uh, 15 and 16. Two places in the New Testament where you could argue an author is quoting as authoritative an intertestamental Jewish work. Uh, even there, I'm not, I don't think that's quite what's going on. But, but certainly broadly you can say, the New Testament shows a remarkable degree of consistency and, and constantly quoting as authoritative what we call the Old Testament scripture and never quoting as authoritative what we call the Apocrypha or the Pseudepigrapha or these other Jewish works. Again, it's, it's a remarkable selectivity that can't be by accident. And I think it's a strong testimony to uh, a canonical consciousness on the part of the early Christians uh, that endorses the canon as, as we understand it. But, but please separate that issue from the, the bigger issue of what kinds of books and writings might have had an influence on our New Testament writers. There, we don't need to draw those lines. There, in fact, on the basis of God's common grace, we can say uh, the, the, the New Testament writers are drawing from all kinds of sources. Uh, 
um, feeding into their understanding of God and Christ. And they don't view those sources as themselves authoritative, uh, but they might see them as having genuine and useful insights into God and his ways in the world. And so they incorporate that in their teaching. And when they incorporate it in their teaching and it becomes New Testament canon, then it becomes authoritative for us. Uh, so, 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 so just as we might, for instance, plunder C.S. Lewis's The Narnia Chronicles for, for a quotation or a saying in a sermon, our, our parishioners are usually not going to say, oh, you think the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe was inspired scripture then because you're quoting it? No, of course not. You're, you're just saying, well, at this point, Lewis does seem to have a, an insight that is truly biblical, that, that captures truth, and he does it in a memorable way, so I'm going to use his words, you see. And the New Testament writers do that all over the place. And so that's what James is doing here. Um, and, and, you know, if you were to ask him, James, where are you getting this idea? Is that from Proverbs or Sirach or Wisdom uh, or Ecclesiasticus uh, he might say, I have no idea. <laughs> it's, it's part of my background, my, 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 my teaching in terms of this wisdom material. And that's kind of the nature of wisdom material, you see. Uh, not, not always to, to go back to a single source, but to have the kind of this tradition. And of course, you have to factor in the, the teaching of Jesus at this point as well, because that was a, a significant influence, obviously, on, on James. Does that help to clarify that, that kind of a, a question? So we have to be very clear on the one hand, yeah, the New Testament gives us good grounds to draw quite clear canonical lines, I believe. And I think that needs to be reasserted because there are few voices on what I would call the left side of evangelicalism that are beginning to, to open up that whole canonical issue again. Uh, so it's something we need to keep paying attention to. But again, on my view, there are pretty clear lines drawn in terms of authoritative scripture. But that in no way, I think, should impede our, um, our openness to see our New Testament authors, you know, plundering all kinds of books, Greco-Roman, Jewish, uh, for ideas that they can use uh, in service of Christian truth. Uh, and uh, when, when one thinks of... Uh, Oh, oh, what's the Salvation Army guy's name? Booth, uh, you know, who famously said, why should the devil have all the good tunes at some point, you know, and said, well, well why shouldn't Christians, you know, use some of the music out there in the world to uh, use as a medium for, for conveying Christian truth? You know, it doesn't endorse where that music came from, but, but it says, yeah, we can use that. Uh, it, it's something that, that can, can help us in, in presenting, teaching the gospel. <clears throat> Let me move on to uh, our next section, and you can see from the slide, and I hope you remember maybe from your reading, that uh, I tend to think, well, in the commentary I certainly did argue, that we have a section here, 119 to 226, that uh, has a certain integrity in theme focused on the Word of God. Um, uh, and uh, the, the way that works out there in specifics then, to give an outline of what's happening, we have our opening section at the end of chapter one, uh, where again, this word, word, is clearly uh, the key word for these series of verses. Of course, we'll, we'll look at how that works out in detail in a moment. Uh, the word that gives new birth now, verse 18, and saves in the future, verse 21, must be obeyed. And I'm going to argue uh, that there uh, is, at this point, a uh, kind of interesting um, help to us in understanding what James is doing in the very traditional Lutheran distinction of law and gospel. Um, a, a distinction that James argues uh, must not be uh, put into a division between the two or a separation between the two. Now, in 2, 1 to 13, it, it seems, of course, that James moves to a completely different issue again. And there's some truth to that. And, and if you remember, what, what does Balkum argue here? Do you remember the way he uh, divides things up? Little, little pop quiz. What, what does Balkum do with the structure here? Exactly right. He, he, he tries to find 12 kind of brief themes in chapter 1 and then 12 sections in chapters 2 to 5 that elaborate those themes. 
Um, I'm not convinced by his 12, by the way. I think he's forced things there. <laughs> um, but th th there's something to be said for viewing it that way. And I'll, I'll have a slide here a little bit later today in which I show how, you know, that could work out a little bit. Um, so, so Balkum kind of sees a, a pretty significant line between chapter one and chapter two then in the way he sees the letter. And again, there's no obviously right way to structure James. Uh, this is one of the things we have to realize that whatever view we hold to about the structure, we need to hold to it with a considerable degree of humility uh, and recognize there are other ways to sort of slice things up. Um, remembering uh, again also that, that where we're trying to slice things up uh, might be an imposition on our biblical books. You know, there's this tendency in our tradition uh, to want to have these again, neat outlines and even the way our Bibles are structured, of course, create some problems there. Uh, I'm sure the TNIV I have here is basically similar to just about all the English Bibles that are open in this room right now. You've got number one, verse markings dividing up the words. You've got paragraphs that are separated out. And in most of our Bibles, you even have section markers with headings perhaps put in them. Um, almost all of our Bibles do that, including our Greek New Testaments, which might not have headings, but have verses and paragraphs. Well, you know, it's just useful to remember at some point that the New Testament writers did not write with verse numbers and chapter numbers. Uh, they wrote continuous Greek. And all of these efforts to divide things up, paragraphs, verses, chapters, come later. They are decisions of translators and editors. And you look at English Bibles and they do it in different ways sometimes. And um, uh, I, I'm still looking for someone to, to publish perhaps even a Greek English New Testament that removes all of the chapter numbers and verse numbers and even paragraph markings perhaps. Because you know it's hard when you, you pick up a text and visually it's separated out this way. It can be hard to really read it continuously sometimes as, as God intends for us to read it perhaps and make our own decisions about what, where to draw the lines and so forth. So, so just, just it's useful to remember that, that we have to be careful um, about these kinds of divisions that, that may not have ever been in James' mind at this point, you know. Um, so at any rate, you, you could say there's a pretty significant break here. Uh, my argument for keeping the material together here is, is the fact that in 2, 8 and following, uh, James comes back to this matter of the word and the law to ground what he's saying about the problem of discrimination in the church. So there is some continuity with the word defined as law here in the end of chapter 1 into this section in chapter 2. And that would be the basis for my uh, argument about c continuity here. Now, in the same way then, 2.14 to 26, well, again, you could say, I'll move to a different topic entirely now. Suddenly, James is going to talk about uh, justification or how we are saved, the need to have faith plus works true. Uh, that, that is clearly the theme there. But, but even that um, has to do, again, with the question of not just hearing, but doing the word. Can't you see how James' idea of faith alone in contrast to a faith that works is parallel to a mere hearing of the word as opposed to a hearing plus doing of the word? Uh, I think there's continuity there, and especially when you note that the end of this uh, section here, verses 12 to 13, James says you need to obey the law because you are going to be judged by your adherence to that law. Which then, of course, raises the question, well, wait a minute, we're going to be judged by adherence to the law? James, I thought we were saved by faith. You can't come along and tell us we need to worry about judgment and doing the law because we're saved by faith, by grace alone, you see. And that is one of the things that sort of leads James to jump off into the section, verses 14 to 26. So that's my overview and my, in a sense, explanation of why I'm treating this material together. All right, let's look then uh, a little more carefully at this um, uh, section at the end of chapter one. Uh, here, James develops uh, 
a very important implicit argument for the unity of God's word. Gave us birth through the word of truth. Uh, accept the word, verse 21. Do the word, verse 22. L don't just listen to the word, 23. And then interestingly, uh, here, note that we have no longer word, but suddenly law creeps into James' vocabulary. But, but clearly, uh, the word here and the law here are equivalent in some ways, aren't they? Because of the continuity of James' argument. So you, you see my point about law and word having a relationship. And the other point I'm trying to uh, make here uh, is the, the uh, contrast between uh, what we might call sort of the positive side of the word, the, the, the gift or grace side of the word. It gives us birth. Verse uh, 18, verse 21, it's planted in us and can save us and we'll be blessed when we do it. But on the other hand then, there is this emphasis on our response to the word, which isn't nearly as clear because I've just tried to use some bold type here, which doesn't show up very well here. Accept it, uh, do it. Um, um, uh, again, uh, continue in it, doing it, do. Uh, so here are the themes that James weaves together uh, very interestingly in this paragraph. And, and what I want to suggest then is that it says to us something very important about the nature of God's word. And we'll, we'll develop that here as we go. In terms of a little more detail then, uh, in verse 18, of course, uh, we, we do have really a verse that is concluding uh, the section that I think begins in verse 2. Uh, um, that, that here is where perhaps we're going to want to draw uh, something of a line. And uh, I, I'm trying to remember the structure I followed here in the commentary. Um, I, I'm tempted, uh, I think, a little bit at this point um, uh, to... Uh, perhaps even put verses 19 and 20 in a little section of their own. Uh, I have them in a, in a sub-paragraph now, but I, I might even just put them in a little paragraph of their own because uh, it does seem to me these verses are, are, are not directly related to anything that comes before them or after. And again, it's almost as if you know, reading Richard Baucom and, and Luke Timothy Johnson has written a very fine commentary of James in, in recent years and a couple of other writers have given me the liberty to say, hey, I don't need to draw a connection here. I'm very unpersuaded that in verses 19 and 20, James is talking about the word of God. That's the way some people try to integrate these verses into the context. Everyone should be quick to listen, read, imply the word of God, uh, slow to speak the word of God. Remember James 3? Don't let many of you seek to be teachers because of the greater judgment you will fall under. You see how that could relate, that word of God could be involved here. But, but if that's the case, it's very hard to understand why James adds slow to become angry. That just doesn't work with a reference to the word of God here. As I point out in the commentary, again here we have good evidence uh, of James being rooted in wisdom tradition. Let me just quote some of these that I have on page 82 in the commentary. Proverbs 17, 28, well-known proverb. Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. Uh, so the idea of slow to speak, you see. A wise person is one who will not quickly rush in, but will ponder and think before he or she speaks. Again, the book of Sirach 5, 11 to 13. Be quick to hear and be deliberate in answering. If you have understanding, answer your neighbor. But if not, put your hand on your mouth. Glory and dishonor come from speaking in a man's tongue as his downfall. Again, this is very traditional wisdom material. Again, Proverbs with respect to anger in speech. Proverbs 17, 27. A man of knowledge uses words with restraint, and a man of understanding is even-tempered. 
You see how the parallel here between uh, the wise as one who is slow to speak, using words with restraint, and one who is even-tempered. Um, so all of that creates, I think, a very plausible background for verses 19 and 20. James is here repeating what we might call proverbial wisdom teaching. A wise person is one who will be slow to speak, careful and deliberate before one rushes into conversation, will be, on the other hand, quick to listen, uh, wanting to hear and understand, and slow to become angry, because these in the proverbial wisdom tradition are often linked. What leads us to speak before we should so often? It's anger, isn't it? We, we fly off the handle, and we, we say something to our, our, our wives, or to our children, or, or to a parishioner uh, that we shouldn't have said. And, and we do that because we become angry. And so these are obviously linked in that way. So verses 19 and 20, uh, the point I'm making here is a place where James just, just briefly touches on what's going to become a very important theme in the book, of course, which we'll, we'll talk about later on today, this whole theme of speech and the importance of governing our speech habits as Christ's disciples. Could you see, could you see this? referring back in the context to verse 13 when he said, I don't know what to say when he is tempted. I am mm. tempted by God. And then, you know, that person then, here he says, be slow to speak, slow to anger. And, and all of it, you know, almost as if the anger of man talked about here is, a, is an anger against God for allowing these trials in his life. And his point is that, you know, God hasn't allowed these trials in order that you might <coughs> fall into sin, but that you might... You know, might grow spiritually and become more mature, and then, and then he says, you know, God is giving, uh, you know, gives you every good and perfect gift. That's his, his desire for you. And yeah. And then he's, he's using this kind of a transition. That's an interesting point. Again, it's, it's, you, know, you raise the whole issue here of how many connections are we supposed to see in what James is doing. And uh, uh, he's not explicit about these, but they might be implicit. And it's very difficult to judge, isn't it? I, I see that there is a possibility of a relationship there. Um, I, I'm not sure that, that, again, because of this background, James is thinking only about our anger against God. No, no, maybe that's part of it. You, you could be right about that. I wouldn't confine it to that myself, but, but I see the point and the connection, and it's a, it's a verse I missed in constructing a slide I'm going to show you in a moment because of the language of say. What's re really interesting is you look throughout James how often he introduces an illustration with the language of saying and speaking. It's kind of just almost an, an implicit theme in which he's talking about the importance of the tongue in a, sl in a, in a different kind of way. And that's, that's a verse, you know, that, that, that should have been added to my list that I'm going to give you a little bit later this morning. Uh, just to comment on the righteousness of God here then, uh, our anger does not produce, uh, I think the, uh, uh, many versions would simply translate here, the righteousness of God. Uh, it is in Greek just a noun with the genitive theu, righteousness of of God was, is one English way to translate. Please understand it is not the literal English way to translate. If I could just make a translation common again, here's where we see the whole fallacy of the idea of a literal translation. Some people say, well, you have a Greek genitive. Uh, the literal translation is an of plus noun. But just think about that for a moment. The Greek does not use a preposition. It has nothing equivalent to our of. The Greek uses a noun in a certain case. And for us to argue that a literal English rendering is the English preposition of plus a noun, that's not literal, is it? You, you, you've made a decision about how to translate the Greek uh, genitive and you've decided our English prepositional phrase is the best way to handle that. But that's not a literal translation, is it? Uh, so this whole idea of literal, you know, versus non-literal and so forth. We just need to put that whole thing to rest. People in translation work don't talk about literal anymore. No one talks about literal anymore because everyone realizes that that whole thing is just a fallacy, but it's so deeply ingrained in our people. How many times do I have people come up to say, Doug, what's the best translation of the Bible? 
And their assumption is, I want the most literal translation of the Bible. Um, it's, just, it, it's so deeply ingrained in us where anyone who does translation from one language to another knows how fallacious uh, the idea of a literal translation is. It's a contradiction in terms. You can have an interlinear that's literal, uh, and that sometimes helps us who, uh, in our Greek and Hebrew, uh, where we're struggling a little bit, but it's not a translation. It, it's, it's just nonsense if you try to do that. Yeah, question. You talked yesterday about preserving ambiguity in uh -huh. translation, if it's in the Greek. With the genitive, we have a ton of ambiguity just in the form. We do. The Greek form, or the English form of, has that same ambiguity. Do you think it's a good idea to translate? It doesn't, though. It, 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 does not. it depends on the construction. Our of plus noun is not always ambiguous. We, we, we think it is, but it's really not, depending on the phrase we're using. For instance, I, I've dealt with this whole issue in, uh, in a commentary in Colossians I finished last year. Um, the famous debated uh, genitive there in, in, in 2.11, the circumcision of Christ is how we, you know, one way to, to translate that. And is it, is, it, is it Christ circumcising us or is it Christ himself being circumcised? And the point I would make here is that in English, the circumcision of Christ is, I think, going to mean, for most people, only one thing. Christ receiving the circumcision. Just because of the way those words work in English. We expect, after a, an active noun idea like circumcision, to have the object of the circumcision. So the point I want to make here is this, that, that, that often, even if we want to preserve ambiguity, we can't. We can't preserve the same ambiguity in the Greek, and a translator often then has to make tough decisions. You know, I can't just transliterate this phrase. Now, I could do an amplified Bible and give four or five you know, options, <laughs> but, but that's not a good option either. So a translator often has to make a tough decision. There's no way I can preserve the ambiguity of this Hebrew or Greek expression in English. I've got to make a decision one way or another and maybe put the option in a footnote or something, and the English Bibles will do that. So, uh, so, so you're absolutely right. When we can preserve a genuine and clear ambiguity, we should try to do so if we can, but we can't always do that. Second, I think some translation philosophies will differ at just this point. In other words, uh, some translation philosophies will say, if it is 95% clear that in this context, this is what this phrase means, then yeah, let's put that in English that way. Um, if it's... 51%, then let's preserve the ambiguity. But then within that spectrum, some translations will say, no, if it's 80% clear, we'll put that in English to help the English reader. Whereas others will say, no, if it's only 80%, we're gonna preserve the ambiguity. That's one of the key ways you can map differences in translation philosophy across the versions. Uh, so the NLT, for instance, will, will make those decisions almost all the time. Uh, trying to, to, to come up with clear, comprehensible English, even if they've made a decision. Uh, whereas like the, the NASB tries as much as it can not to make any of those d -d decisions. But of course it has to all over the place. Uh, it's a translation, so of course it makes those decisions all the time. Where do you draw that line personally? Um, I, I'm pretty happy on the whole with where we do it in the T and IV. And one of the things we did in the TNIV is we kept more ambiguity than in the NIV. It's a wide, it's a wide misperception that the TNIV is looser or something than the NIV. It's, rather, it's just the opposite. Uh, what we did in the TNIV is move the whole translation slightly more toward the formal equivalent side. Um, so for instance, where the NIV in Romans 1.17 has the righteousness from God, uh, making a clear decision about what's going on there. In the TNAV, we said, no, it's not that clear. Scholars are, divi are, are, are divided. So it, it's, 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 it's more ambiguous. It's, it's a little bit more open if we translate the righteousness of God. So we, we did that an awful lot. And I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with, with where we did that. An another factor, please consider in translations. A lot of us who are serious students of scripture, who are taking Greek and Hebrew, who are studying this stuff, uh, we, we, want, we have a pretty high level of reading. And we can understand some pretty difficult English at times because by definition, we're here, we're, we're, we're well educated. Um, sometimes versions that are trying to preserve a lot of the underlying Greek and Hebrew structure uh, 
end up not translating in very easily comprehensible English. I, no, 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 I said easily comprehensible. It is comprehensible, yes. But I would just urge you to think in a more missions-oriented way about the average reader of Scripture who doesn't have the kind of education we have, who doesn't have the background in, in biblical studies, who obviously doesn't have Greek and Hebrew. And, and this is where I think we need to be very, very reluctant to criticize unduly something like the New Living Translation, let's say. Because, you know, you start studying Greek and Hebrew and say, oh, look what they've done here, you know, with the Greek and the Hebrew. Look at what they've done in the English. But, but arguably, the NLT reads clearly and communicates to people. And that that should be the goal of translation, shouldn't it? Not just to be translating for the elite, the well-educated, uh, but to be translating for everybody. And most of you who are pastoring know very well one of the biggest issues we face when we start talking about the Word of God, how many people in our churches can really read for understanding anymore? Because they don't do much reading. Everything is, is media, everything is visual. Um, and I know sometimes I'm just in despair when I am working with lay people in my church and trying to work patiently through a passage of scripture and realize that they're just not able to read very well. That has massive implications for our ministry. I mean, my theory of ministry has always been, I want to be not the person who tells people what the Bible says. I want to be the person who helps people see for themselves what's in scripture and get excited about it and be motivated by it. But that's becoming more and more difficult to do, uh, I think, uh, with, with people because they just aren't able to read for themselves as well. And I'm saying that has implications for how you translate then. If you want a translation that's going to be understandable uh, without an expert sort of to, to tell people what it means. Now, that, that, that's a bit of an excursus. Let's, let's move back. I do think here, to go back to our phrase, the righteousness of God is probably being used in sort of the traditional Old Testament Jewish way. Normally this language of righteousness um, has the idea of the behavior that God approves of. Um, and I think pretty clearly that's what James means by it here. Our, our anger does not produce the behavior God wants to see in his people. And if you look through the Old Testament use of righteousness, that's, that's, that's kind of the normal way it's used. Righteousness language is used to talk about the behavior that God's covenant people are supposed to have. This is the way it's used in Matthew's gospel. Some argue contrary to that, but I think it's pretty clear in Matthew that Jesus, again, is using righteousness language in that way. Uh, make sure your righteousness is greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees. In that context, it's clear, isn't it? Jesus is talking about our behavior. We're supposed to have a level of commitment to God and deeply rooted, heartfelt attitude toward God that is the, the attitude and behavior he expects of us. Uh, I'm saying that now to help us understand what's going on in James 2 tomorrow. Uh, to realize that, that James is using this language against the Old Testament Jewish background. Uh, and again, our problem here has been too often reading James through the filter of Paul's language and then criticizing James for coming up short. Grossly unfair, isn't it? Uh, there's no reason for James to be using the language the way Paul does, who himself is more the innovator here. Uh, um, again, we'll, we'll, we'll pick this up again tomorrow, but it's useful making the point here. Yeah? So on the righteousness that God desires, uh -huh. was that viewed... Um, in this translation by the committee as more ambiguous than righteousness of God? Oh no, righteousness of God is ambiguous. Right. And, and, and the problem I think we felt in using that phrase is that people would too easily think immediately of Paul's righteousness of God language, his famous... Uh, no, I, it might be the righteous belonging to God, but, but generally people take Paul's righteousness of God either as God's righteousing activity or the righteousness that is valid before God, which has been the, the, the traditional Protestant way of understanding the, the, the language. It's, in other words, it talks about our forensic standing. It's, it's talking about uh, who we are before God, our status. And I think it's pretty clear myself that that's not what James means by the language at all. So if you translate righteousness of God here, you could give the English reader the impression it has the same meaning as Paul's phrase, whereas the righteousness that God desires 
which is what the TNIV does, um, uh, and, the, and the NLT uh, as, as a well here, um, uh, I think you avoid that, 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 that misconception, as it were. Now, um, in verse 18, at the end of that verse, where Paul, uh, Paul, James, 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 where James has been talking about the uh, good gifts, remember, God gives us, the God who is unchanging, uh, who, who is not like the, uh, the, the astronomical phenomena we observe with all the motions and so forth. God is unchanging, consistent, dependable. Uh, he gives good things to his people. And preeminently, the gift he gives us is this new birth by the word of truth. So here's where the word has come into the discussion. And now James picks that up in verse 21. That's why, again, in the way I structure James, I put uh, a paragraph break here uh, with verse 21. Viewing 19 and 20 as sort of a, a little unit on its own. And then with therefore, in verse uh, 21, uh, James uh, sort of comes back to the idea of the word. He briefly mentioned in verse 18 and begins to elaborate that throughout the following paragraph. So again, if I were in charge, and, and I guess it's, it's probably very good that I'm not, um, I would put a paragraph break between verse 20 and 21. And, uh, and put listening and doing, uh, I'll change that heading to talk about the Word of God or something. I'm talking about the uh, TNIV here. Obviously, I didn't get my way on this one. I didn't persuade the committee. So it's probably not a good idea if I couldn't even persuade the committee. We took a very conservative approach, though. It took a 75% vote to change anything in the NIV, in the TNIV, because we, we deliberately wanted to, you know, make it hard to make uh, changes. At any rate, it does seem to me that the therefore then brings in this uh, teaching about the word of God. Um, of course, there's a relationship to what James has just been saying. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. There's kind of a link with 19 and 20 uh, where, Paul, where James again has talked about these uh, issues of behavior. But then he goes on to say, uh, receive or accept the implanted word which is able to save you. Elsewhere in the New Testament, I think seven or eight times, I think maybe all of them in the book of Acts, the language of receiving the word uh, talks about conversion. Uh, an apostle or someone preaches the gospel and people accept the word, meaning uh, we hear it, we, we apply it, we, we respond to it, uh, we, we, we accept the word in its life-changing power. Uh, accepting the word is a way to talk about conversion. Uh, pretty obviously though, that does not work very well here in James. James is writing to Christians. James is writing to people who already know Christ. Uh, therefore, most interpreters agree that what James is referring to here is not an initial accepting of the word of God at conversion, but a continuing receiving, accepting of the word and allowing it to transform our lives. And I think uh, making that point even more strongly is the language of the implanted word. Non-Christians do not have an implanted word. Before you come to Christ, you don't have God's word planted in you. Uh, I think that would be foreign to the New Testament conception of the non-Christian or the word of God. So, so these factors combined together, again, I think lead naturally to the conclusion that James is encouraging here Christians to be receiving, accepting, allowing the word of God to transform them so that they might be saved in the end. Now, a couple comments on that, see if you have any, any questions. Um, first, I, I am translating implanted here. 
Um, you could also translate this word um, as uh, inherent or innate. And a couple of interpreters have suggested that over the years. Um, again, I think you, you get into a questionable biblical anthropology when you do that, to think of uh, the word of God as innate, innate, sorry, or inherent in human beings. Uh, and so some say, well, maybe it's not the word of God here. Maybe it's the, the, the broader uh, concept of God's message or purpose or something. But I think that's hard in this context. So, so most of our versions, I think, translate something like planted in you. And I think that's appropriate for the word here. In which case, uh, I would like to suggest that, that James is probably to some extent influenced by the famous New Covenant prophecy of Jeremiah. Uh, that word that uh, first gives us new birth in verse 18 comes to reside in us. We internalize it in accordance with Jeremiah's new covenant prophecy that, that, that God would enter into this new covenant with his people, that he would put his law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Of course, there's an extensive quotation from the same passage in Hebrews uh, 8. And there are allusions to this famous prophecy in many other places uh, in the uh, New Testament. So I think what, what James, again, is probably doing is reflecting that tradition here. Uh, the word of God in the New Covenant is no longer written on tablets of stone it's no longer external to us. And so if you remember the, 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 the prophecy here in Jeremiah, you, we will not have to teach our, our neighbors because everyone will know the Lord uh, because God will enter in to a new relationship with his people that is internalized and that transforms from within. So the obedience that, that, that Israel could not give to God because Israel was in a sense untransformed. Uh, God now by his spirit works that, 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 that great um, uh, 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 work again uh, of transformation from within. And you remember that in the kind of parallel Ezekiel prophecy to Jeremiah, Ezekiel talks very clearly about the spirit and God giving the spirit and putting it within us and changing the, uh, the, the hardness of the heart, the, 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 the stony heart into a, a fleshy heart that would be responsive to God. So that's a kind of implied step here in James' discussion of the word of God in the life of the people of God. Uh, we hear the word, it gives us new birth, it's the instrument by which God brings us into his kingdom, converts us, regenerates us. But then that word becomes something which resides in us. It's not just out there. But, but God puts it in us, uh, and it's that word within us that we are to be accepting in, in the sense of let the word of God do its work in us. Uh, uh, open ourselves to its influence, uh, to its guidance, to its direction, uh, to its transforming power. I think that's what James is saying here, all with a view toward eventual salvation on the last day. We touched on this yesterday, but we, we need to recall at this point that our popular Christian use of the language of save and salvation is clearly rooted in Scripture, but tends to uh, misrepresent the use of the word in Scripture a little bit. In, in this sense, that there are verses in the New Testament where save and salvation are used for what we might call conversion. Uh, clearly those verses are there, no question about that. But the majority of verses where save and salvation are used refer to the ultimate climax of God's work in us when our bodies are transformed and we appear with Christ in glory. A uh, couple of illustrations that are, I think, well known probably to most of us. Uh, Romans 5, 9, um, having been justified by uh, God's work, by, by the blood of Christ, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? You see, people who are justified are still looking forward to being saved. Uh, 
Or again, in Romans, later on in chapter 13, Paul writing to Christians, your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. Obviously, people have believed. They've come into God's kingdom. They've been saved in one sense, but they haven't been saved in the ultimate sense. And, and this is, again, this tension of the already, not yet, that we have to be so careful to preserve in Scripture. If we say, I have been saved, and simply use the past tense. And again, there's New Testament precedent for that. Now, I'm not arguing against saying that. But if that's all we say, it can lead to the very thing James is concerned about. Namely, the attitude among so many Christians that having come to faith, having raised my hand, walked the aisle, been baptized, whatever language we want to use from our own tradition here, having done that, I'm set. I don't have to worry anymore about my relationship to God. That's put in place. And very few people are going to say it quite that way, but I would suggest to you that a lot of our people, deep down, subconsciously, believe just that, and that governs their behavior. Specifically, that leads to a lack of real concern about growth and holiness. I'm taken care of. See, if you emphasize the already too much. Now, if you emphasize the not yet too much, on the other hand, then you have people who are anxious and uncertain, who don't have any assurance of being a child of God, you know, who are, who are constantly saying, oh, I need to keep doing things in order to get God's favor. And, and it leads to a works mentality, to a legalism, to anxiety and doubt. And we have people like that who are just consumed with uncertainty about whether God's going to accept them because they think it rests on their works, which of course it never does. So there's need for balance is the point. Paul emphasizes the already because of the situation he is addressing in Romans, let's say. Uh, we are justified by faith now. It's faith, it's grace, it's not these works of the law. But James, remember, is concerned about Christians who are not leading a Christian life. Christians who... Uh, are presuming on grace, it seems. And so naturally, he tends to emphasize the not yet. Uh, you, in one sense, James is saying, aren't saved yet. You still have to appear before God. There's still a judgment to come. There's still a day of wrath. There's still a day of accounting ahead of you. Uh, and in light of, and as you look toward that day, you need to be letting the word of God do its work. You need to be accepting the word and responding to it. Now, any questions before we move into 22 and following? I guess uh, the only thing I'm wondering is, can we separate out <clears throat> being saved on the day of judgment from our spiritual salvation? I, I think... Physical, physical, I agree that physical deliverance, <laughs> that makes sense, but... How do you separate that from the reality that you won't be saved physically if you want to use that, if you don't have spiritual salvation? I'm not sure what you mean by saved physically. Well, I, you mentioned the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. That, if you're not saved eternally, or when we talk about being saved, then you won't be saved on that day either. Mm -hmm. So can you divide, and, and so how do you get away from, if you don't receive the word of God, it works righteousness type of the system in the end. No, I, I think that there is a, a very significant tension here that needs to be maintained. Uh, theologically, we are going to come down on one side or another. That is, we're either going to come down on the side that says, when we are initially saved, if I can use that language for a moment, we know that we are going to finally be saved. In other words, we'll take a more Calvinist view of security and perseverance and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, you could say we are saved initially, uh, but uh, it, it is still important that we do certain things or, or react in certain ways if we uh, are going to seek to be saved finally. And that, that might not happen. And so we would uh, have an Arminian soteriology in which we say it's possible for someone to, as we say in the popular way, lose their salvation. Uh, 
Uh, I come to salvation at a certain point, uh, but then I don't respond to God as I should. I don't maintain my faith as I should, uh, and I don't end up being saved on the last day. So that's, in terms of, of, of theology, you know, you kind of draw a line at that point, and decide which, which side you're going to come down on. And I, I, I still tend to come down on the Calvinist side of that line. I think that, the, the, that that's a better explanation for most of the data. But I, I do think that when we recognized how enduring are these two different options, how many very good theologians and Christians throughout the history of the church have held each view, I would suggest that we need to be cautious uh, at this point about saying we've got all the truth on one side. So I want to say on the one hand, I want to resolve it theologically, and I tend to resolve it in a more Calvinist way. But having said that, the next thing I want to say is I'm also anxious to preserve what I think is a genuine biblical tension here that I think is deliberate in terms of ministry with the people of God. On the one hand, Scripture wants to say, when you come to faith in Christ, you are justified, and that is the final decisive verdict that can't be changed. Great assurance that we can have. Uh, certainty that we are God's children, and that that will never change. And yes, I want to say that. But we, and as a Calvinist, I say that. But as a Calvinist, then, I have to recognize that there are a lot of biblical passages that also say uh, you need to allow your faith and the Spirit to have its work in you if you expect to be saved on the last day. Is that contradictory? I don't, I'm not sure it's contradictory, but I think it is a tension that we need to observe in Scripture. I'll say more about that tomorrow. Um, uh, again, I think too often here we have divided up along a theological line. Well, I'm a Calvinist. I believe in eternal security. I'm an Arminian. I don't. Um, and then sort of that's the end of the story. Um, uh, again, I think here we need to be sensitive to brothers and sisters who have also thought very hard about these things um, who have come to different conclusions than we have, and not simply, it's, I don't think it's as simple as saying, well, I know what Scripture says and you don't. Um, it, it's, it's condescending, it's demeaning, it, 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 it can even be arrogant uh, uh, if, we, if, we, if we too quickly or too much hammer that point. I think we need to be sensitive. Why have so many faithful Christians, good serious, Bible-loving expositors of the Word come to a different conclusion on this matter than I have. And maybe the reason is, well, there's, there's genuine tension in Scripture. There are different perspectives here. And that uh, theologically, if I come down here, again, as I do as a Calvinist, uh, the next thing I want to do is say, and yet I see the other side here. And I want to, 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 to give credence to that. Um, I think, again, Scripture preserves a very careful balance here so that on the one hand, uh, God gives to his people assurance without presumption. That's the problem with assurance, isn't it? It, it, it falls into a presumption attitude. Uh, I'm set. I'm, I'm okay. Uh, I don't need to worry anymore about this. Uh, and on the other hand, it, it wants to uh, encourage us to a, a, a zealous pursuit of holiness without anxiety. And I think the scriptures it continues to balance these things out. Has anyone tried to develop a view that, it, that save your souls has nothing to do with the spiritual, but to do with just physical temporal <clears throat> deliverance? There have been a couple of people have argued that extraordinarily unconvincingly, in my view. Um, um, uh, particularly with the word suke here, um, uh, I think that's awfully hard. Uh, uh, it's more popular to see that in, in James 5, uh, 19 to 20, where you don't have quite the same language. You have the word save there. But no, I, in these passages, save clearly is, you know, spiritual, ultimate spiritual deliverance. I think that's pretty clear. <clears throat> so we'll talk more about that tomorrow. And again, please, please don't misunderstand me. I, I continue uh, to come down. And, and, and I'm happy to call myself, in that sense, reformed. Uh, I'm a Calvinist in my soteriology. Um, 
But I, I just think it's a matter, at least for me, of looking at these kinds of passages that we're looking at in James and in Paul also. It's not that Paul's Calvinist and James is Arminian. <laughs> you get some of these same kinds of passages in Paul. Uh, you know, sometimes p- people think, well, you know, Hebrews is a problem. If I can explain away Hebrews in terms of eternal security, then I've got Paul on my side and I'm all set. No, it's not that simple because Paul has some very hard things to say as well uh, on the side of what we would call an Arminian way of reading uh, things. And again, I come down on a Calvinist side for various reasons, but I am concerned to preserve what I think is a genuine biblical tension here. You know, some see the tension so strong uh, to to the point where they say, you know, we don't have enough data to decide whether to believe in eternal security or not. Uh, And I I think that I'm not particularly happy with that. I don't, I don't, I think it might go too far in elevating the tension to sort of permanent locked in thing. But, but at least we have to recognize these different perspectives, I think. Yes. The implanting of the word is that, is that a one-time event at salvation, or is that an mm-hmm. ongoing process? And then what is the, the scope or content of the word that's implanted? You know, that, 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 I, I think that's really hard to know whether James sees it as a process or as a one-time thing. I, but my tendency on the basis of other passages might be to see it as sort of a one-time thing, that you know, when, when I come to Christ, part of what happens is that God puts his spirit within me. Uh, the spirit comes to dwell within me. And, and I think again, in these Old Testament prophecies and in the New Testament as well, this, this implanting of the word, this, this, this word put within us and the ministry of the spirit are closely related. So for that reason, I'll, I'll think more as a kind of a one time, when I come to Christ, that's one of the things he does. He puts the spirit within me. And uh, as, as, an, as an element of that, the word of God comes to rest within me as well. Um, how broad is it? Um, you know, here again, it's interesting, of course, in James' context, as we have to remember, with no New Testament books having been written yet. I happen to think James is the first New Testament book to appear. Um, uh, is, uh, the, the word has the sense, you know, of, of God's message, um, uh, uh, including the Old Testament, as we're going to see, but also the message of salvation, the message of the gospel, because Clearly, that's the word of truth that gives us new birth in verse 18, isn't it? Uh, you know, there's no reference to a written gospel there, which doesn't exist yet, but clearly there's some reference to the proclamation of Christ, uh, the word of truth uh, of the gospel that uh, is being preached and proclaimed and taught orally in James' time. <clears throat> yes, well. Uh, critical text has a comment, uh, excuse me, a comma after meekness which implies that it goes with putting aside all filthiness. And, but no English translation that I have found takes meekness with the preceding. It takes it with the uh-huh. imperative received. Yep. Why in the world is that the case? Uh, why, why in the world do they take it with what follows? But why, <coughs> if the comma is after productivity, meekness, uh-huh. why does every English translation that I've Consulted, not take it with what precedes. <laughs> That's interesting. But takes it with receive the implanted word with meekness or humble. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I mean, it's, uh, again, you have one of these issues, of course, the, the, the comma has been added by editors at some point, um, but, but why all the editors added it there and all the translators ignored it is a good question. <laughs> it really is. Uh, I hadn't really n- n- noticed that before, but yeah, I, uh, did, do any of the English translations take humbly with what comes before? A revised English Bible that takes it that way in the margin. R.E.B. in the margin, that's all. That's very it's interesting. Even their footnote <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I had noticed that, that disjunction before. And I, um, I, I think the one thing to be said is that in my experience, sometimes the punctuation we find in our Greek New Testaments is, is odd, if I could put it that way. Um, and I don't, I, I'm not a good enough textual critic to know how all of this got in, you know. And... Um, uh, where it came from. There are some, there are a few of our ancient Greek manuscripts that have some kind of marks of punctuation. It's, it's not very often, it's not very common. I don't know about, about it in this case. So yeah, I, I don't have a good explanation for that. I, it does seem to me to make more sense to take it with what follows than with what precedes, but <laughs> why the comma comes there, I don't know. <clears throat> 
It's an excellent question.